Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Science and Technology with Ms. Hinkson. You just finished looking at the relief or the landscape of our Earth's surface. And in this process, you were talking about a lot of different things of, you know, that influence the way that our landscape looks. You talked about erosion, weathering, deposition, but a lot of the times we were talking about water or water in its liquid state or water in its solid state, whether it be glaciers or ice. We talked about how water is involved in the, um, in the shaping of our landscape. So it's only natural that we talk about the hydrosphere next. Again, I know you're tired of seeing the slide, but I have to show it to you because we're talking about <clears throat> Earth system science and we're talking about how all these different spheres are involved with one another. The lithosphere is what we were looking at before uh, and that involves the solid Earth. So we were talking about the relief, um, the evolution of the landscape of where we are or the landscape of the Earth. We were talking about the rock cycles and all that stuff and that involved the lithosphere, as I mentioned. The hydrosphere was involved in that because we were, we were speaking about water. And then we also talked about uh, the biosphere, which is which involves all living things. We talked about how the living things have affected our landscape as well. And obviously we talked about the atmosphere. We talked about wind and air and stuff like that. We haven't covered the atmosphere in depth yet. That will be what will follow from the hydrosphere. So when you look at these pictures, what do they all have in common? I'll give you a second to think about it. It should come right to your head. It should pop up. What do they have in common? Obviously water, if you look at every one of these pictures, water's involved. Even if you look at the plant and you didn't notice, plants need water to grow. So water is very important and you guys know this already. So what is the hydrosphere? In your textbook, it mentions that the hydrosphere comes from the Greek words, uh, meaning water and spheria, which um, means a spherical object, right? So. A sphere of water. <laughs> so more than two thirds of the Earth, Earth's surface is covered in water, uh, filling oceans, seas, lakes, and rivers. So two thirds, that is a lot. If you wanna find out the percentage of that, you would do two divided by three times 100, and you'd find out about 67% of the Earth is covered in water. Water is also found um, underground in the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is the gases, it, it's uh, the air that, surround it, that surrounds us in the form of a vapor. So vapor is basically um, when a liquid is no longer a liquid, I should say, a substance is no longer a liquid, it's in the gas phase. And in glaciers in the form of snow and ice. So again, water is also found underground in the atmosphere in the form of vapor and in glaciers. Up to 60% of the human adult body is water. The hydrosphere is the Earth's outer layer of water, uniting water in all its states, liquid, solid, and gas. So here we see the states of matter You've seen this before, but again, don't ever forget it because it'll follow you forever. You see this every day, you're exposed to that. This is solid water, this is liquid water, and this is H2O, which is water in the gas form. So water present on the earth is either fresh or salty. The water of the seas and oceans is salty because of the great quantity of mineral salts dissolved in it. These mineral salts come from rocks. So already you see the lithosphere 
which um, involves rocks, right? So rocks are part of the lithosphere. You see that they play a role or they influence the hydrosphere as well. When you looked at the composition of rocks, you saw that they were heterogeneous. They were a mixture of minerals, um, often salts. So when these rocks undergo erosion, weathering and deposition, and they find themselves settled in water, some of their salt is broken down or degraded into the water and that would make the water salty. So again, we also said water is present on the earth as either fresh or salty. Fresh water covers only about 3% of the earth's surface. Moreover, most of the water on earth is frozen. For example, in the ice caps and glaciers hold three quarters of the world's fresh water reserves. So if you look at this, this is the earth, the water that's on the earth. 97.5% of that water is salt water. Only 2.5% is fresh water. And now let's look at what that two, where you can find that 2.5%. So let's go here. 79% of that fresh water is occupied in glaciers, meaning it's frozen. And then 21% of this little sliver here is um, of fresh water is found in lakes, rivers, and groundwater. So this figure is from another, another textbook, the Observatory 3 textbook, and it shows the distribution of water on Earth. So again, most of the water that we have on Earth, 97.5% of it, is salt water. Only 2.5% of it is fresh water. And unfortunately, 79% of that fresh water is not accessible because it's frozen in glaciers. So glacier is an accumulation of snow transformed into ice that slowly descends into a valley. Freshwater covers about 3% of the Earth's surface. Moreover, most of the freshwater on Earth is frozen. We just talked about that in ice caps and glaciers. So this means that this freshwater in glaciers and ice caps is inaccessible. So as much as we would like some fresh water, it is inaccessible because it is frozen. So drinking water, we're talking about the hydrosphere, we're talking about fresh water, salty water and all these things. Well, what are the characteristics of drinking water? What is drinking water? So drinking water is water that is safe to drink. What does safe to drink mean? Obviously, we would want to drink water that wouldn't do any harm to our bodies, right? We need water. We see how much of our body is actually made up of water. And we need to put water in our system. But we need it to be safe. Drinking water is not the same as pure water. Pure water would mean that there was nothing else in the water, only H2O molecules. Okay, so this is a glass of pure water. If you look and you zoom in, all you have in there is H2O molecules. There's nothing else in there. There's no mineral salts. There is no substance that is going to um, kill bacteria or anything like that. It is simply made up of H2O, which is water. So it's pure water. However, drinking water is not pure water. The water that comes out from your tap is not simply H2O. Drinking water is a mixture of water molecules and certain dissolved substances. The main mineral salts dissolved in water are calcium, magnesium, and sodium. So you can even sometimes taste in the water that there are salts in there. Not, it doesn't taste super salty, but you can tell that the water is not pure. You taste different things in it. But if it tastes terrible and tastes bad, then that definitely means that your drinking water is contaminated. Your drinking water should not smell um, 
It should not have a um, disgusting smell. It should not have a disgusting taste. It should be smooth to drink. And, um, and like I said, if it's not like that, then your water has been contaminated with something. So just information, more information about drinkable water. <clears throat> Must be perfectly transparent. You guys live in a country for the most part where you are lucky your water comes out of the tap, given that everything is okay with your pipes, your water is transparent. Unfortunately, there are people in countries where they don't have access to clean drinking water. So their water is not perfectly transparent. Furthermore, sometimes their water is not transparent at all. So you should be very happy that you have access to great water like this. Your drinkable water must not have suspended particles. So basically your drinking water should be homogeneous. You shouldn't be seeing little particles, solid particles suspended in your water. If it does have particles in it, this is not drinkable water, you certainly shouldn't drink it. Drinkable water must not have an unpleasant odor. Of course not, if your water smells unpleasant and disgusting, then it's been contaminated with some other type of substance and you should not drink it. It must only contain a small quantity of dissolved minerals, right? So a small quantity in the sense that you can barely taste it. If you can start tasting minerals and salts and it tastes like you're drinking rock water, then this is not drinkable water. There are way too many minerals in your water. It must contain dissolved oxygen, must not contain microorganisms that can cause disease. Obviously not. Chlorine is often added to tap water to destroy bacteria. Now, can you think of another time where you've heard of the word chlorine and water simultaneously? Where have you heard about that? Give you a second to think about it. Your pools, right? For the most part, well, not for the most part, your pools should definitely have some sort of substance or some sort of agent in it that will kill bacteria, um, especially those um, because your pools are exposed to the environment. There are many different things that are in the environment that can get in your pool. The chlorine is put there to neutralize or to destroy um, bacteria or microorganisms so that can be harmful. So I'm, we're talking about drinking water and we're talking about, um, you know, having safe drinking water and I'm telling you how sometimes we take these things for granted. So I'm wondering if you've ever heard about the Flint water crisis. Have you ever heard of it? So on April 25th, 2014, officials looking to save money switched Flint, Michigan's drinking water supply from the Detroit city system to the Flint River. This new water was highly corrosive. If you look at this picture in the bottom there that gives you a picture or depicts what corrosive is, what do you think it means? Think about it. All right, so you can see by this picture that this substance is corrosive and it's destroying whatever it touches. So basically corrosive material is highly reactive substance that causes obvious damage to living tissue. Um, so it's, it's like an acid, an acid could be corrosive, a base, right? It's very dangerous, yet alone to the touch Imagine what it was like to be drinking highly corrosive water. The city and state officials broke federal law by failing to treat the water properly. Lead leached out from aging pipes into thousands of homes. So lead is very dangerous for the human body as well. Soon after the switch, Flint residents complained about dark colored, foul tasting, smelly water, as well as skin rashes and hair loss. So this was the regular Detroit water. You can see that it's relatively transparent. And this water 
in this bottle is what the Flint residents had access to. So their pipes, their kitchen sinks, their baths, everywhere they went, this is the water that was coming out of the pipes. This is very unfortunate. A lot of um, some people died from this and developed complications from the um, contaminants in the water. And a lot of people got very sick. So you can read more about it by following that link. All right, so just a little quick trivia time to see if you remember some of the stuff that we just looked at. So why is sea water, sea water, <laughs> why is sea water salty? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Think about it. Does it have anything to do with the lithosphere or anything that we've seen in the lithosphere? Seawater is salty because it contains a considerable amount of dissolved mineral salts. They are carried by waterways to seas and oceans where they accumulate. So the dissolved mineral salts, where do those come from? Does the salt come from your salt shaker at home? I think not. So the dissolved mineral salts that they're talking about <clears throat> comes from the degradation and the breaking down of rocks. Because if you remember correctly, rocks are made up of minerals. All right, so where do mineral salts present in water come from? I'm not sure where you would find this answer from. This might be new information to you or not, because I just said it. <laughs> so the mineral salts in seawater come from rocks. What is the difference between fresh water <clears throat> and salt water? <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> Have you thought about it? All right, it's the quantity of dissolved mineral salts. So fresh water um, would have a low amount of dissolved mineral salts. <clears throat> and obviously salt water would have a lot more of dissolved mineral salts in it. What is the difference between fresh water and drinking water? They sound the same. Is there a difference? Drinking water is fresh water that is clean enough to drink. So if we remember correctly, we said that 97.5% of the Earth's water is salt water and only 2.5% of that water is fresh water. And we also discussed that those are the fresh water. 79% uh, is occupied by glaciers or polar ice caps. So it's inaccessible. And then we'd have to go to lakes and other stuff like that to get fresh water. And obviously uh, in, our in our cities, we have water filtration plants that take the fresh water and further um, treat it so that it is more safe for drinking because obviously the fresh water, because it's out in the environment, would be exposed to different organisms and whatnot. So we would still need to treat the fresh water in order for it to be drinking water. So why are so many living things unable to use three fourths of the world's reserves of fresh water. So I've talked about this multiple times during this presentation. So I'll give you a moment to collect your thoughts. Again, why are so many living things unable to use approximately 75% of the world's reserves of fresh water? because three-fourths of the world's reserves are frozen. I just mentioned that, right? In terms of glaciers and polar ice caps.
water covers nearly 75% of the planet's surface, why then is it considered a precious resource that should not be wasted? That's a very good question. If we have so much water, then why are people always saying, don't waste the water, don't waste the water? If we have so much of it, it's in abundance. Because we need non-polluted fresh water to survive. And this resource represents only about 0.02% of the water on the planet. Moreover, this water is unequally distributed among humans. So in order to read about the hydrosphere or read more in depth, you are required to read pages 302 in your 302 to 305, sorry, in your Eureka textbook. So now we're going on to talk about the water cycle. Uh, it is a part of the hydrosphere, but there's a lot, we have this word cycle again. Aren't you guys tired of this word cycle? What did the word cycle mean? Is there a beginning and an end when we have a cycle or is it continuous and it's just going around and around? And what, and what shape did I tell you to think about when you hear the word cycle? Think about it. Yes, a circle, right? So there is this action of water just circling, circling through the water cycle, changing its state from gas to liquid solid and just going around and around and around. And that's because of the water cycle. Earth's water is always in movement and the natural water cycle, also known as the hydrologic cycle, describes the continuous movement of water on, above and below the surface of the earth. Right, so we see above and then we see below and then there's on right water follows a cycle there is no beginning or end water is always changing states between liquid vapor which is another word for gas and ice which is a solid with these processes happening in the blink of an eye and over millions of years. So because it's a cycle, we mentioned there's no beginning, no end, it is continuous. So this is a figure from your textbook on page 336. It shows the water cycle. It says figure 50, water is continually being transformed so what do we mean by transformed? It's not changing into any other type of substance. It's being transformed between the three states of matter. It is being transformed between liquid, solid, and gas. It travels from the Earth's surface to the atmosphere in an endless cycle. This is called the water cycle. So here we see evaporation. So we can see that this here is water in its liquid form. Evaporation would mean the liquid is turning into a gas. So we have liquid water turning into water vapor. And then it condenses in the clouds. And then when it condenses, okay, so we have this idea, we talked about it. When it's in a gas form, the particles are far apart. When the particles are closer together, we now have a liquid. So if I have water vapor after evaporation, right, and the gas particles are very far, and then I condense, right, I condense those particles, they now get closer to each other, and then I condense my gas, my H2O gas, right, my water vapor, back into liquid form. And then what happens when it's in liquid form, it falls as precipitation. So whether that's rain or snow, it'll come from the clouds. And then we have it in liquid form again. It'll come down the uh, landscape, right? So there's an incline, it'll run off, go back into the bodies of water or go underground, undergo infiltr uh, infiltration 
and then it'll end up in a body of water again and it'll just keep on going. We have the idea that plants and other living organisms um, give off water vapor, right? Or even, so when we're talking, and we talked about this even in regards, in regards to the coronavirus, although we don't see things coming out of our mouth, there are particles that come out of our mouth um, that, are, that have water in it. And just the same thing with trees, They're, we're giving off gases, we're giving off water vapor, right? So we're putting moisture into the atmosphere as well. So these are the four main stages of the water cycle. One, evaporation. Evaporation transforms the water of the oceans and other bodies of water into water vapor. In this way, water passes to the gaseous state. So again, we have liquid water going into the gas phase. Living things through respiration and transpiration also produce water vapor. This phenomenon is also called evapotranspiration. So this is again, living organisms putting moisture back into the atmosphere. All of this water vapor ends up in the atmosphere. So this is one part, condensation. When the water vapor, which is a gas, crosses a colder zone, it turns to liquid again. This is condensation or cloud formation. Again, so remember when you're boiling water on the stove, you are adding energy to the water, you are heating it up, and soon you'll find that your liquid water turns into a gas, you start seeing steam coming out of your pot. But if you cooled it down or you put a cover on your pot, your cover has, um, is cooler than what's in the pot, it will cause those gas particles to turn back into liquid and you would see condensation occurring. So you would see water droplets appear on the cover of your pot. Clouds are made of groups of water droplets. These droplets have condensed on flecks of dust in the atmosphere. So first there was evaporation. Evaporation involves liquid turning into gas, condensation, <clears throat> gas turning into liquid. And then what happens to that liquid? It falls from the clouds. We have precipitation. The minuscule droplets of water that form clouds, gra <clears throat> sorry, gradually enlarge. Ultimately, they become too heavy to remain in the atmosphere. They then fall to the ground in the form of precipitation. So now, when they fall to the ground, what happens? Well, runoff and inf infiltration. Then the water returns to the waterways via runoff over the Earth's surface. The water can also seep to the underground reservoirs by infiltration. So this is a pretty cool website that is an interactive um, water cycle diagram. Let, let's see if I can go back. So you can do beginner says the water cycle describes how Earth's water is not only always changing forms between liquid rain, solid ice and gas vapor, but also moving on above and in the Earth. This process is always happening everywhere. So you can go through here and follow the water and then just see what these different things are. So groundwater, we have lakes, we have rivers, runoff. So runoff, when rain hits the land or snow melts, it flows downhill over the landscape. This is called runoff, which provides water to rivers, lakes, and the oceans. Some runoff even soaks into the ground to become groundwater. Precipitation, the tiny cloud droplets combine with each other and grow into bigger water drops. When they get too heavy, they fall to the earth as precipitation, such as rain, 
and snow in cloud climate, in, sorry, in cold climates, precipitation builds up as snow and ice, solid forms of water. <clears throat> the sun, the sun is the real boss of the water cycle and it doesn't even live here on earth. The sun provides heat or energy, which is what makes the water cycle work. <clears throat> sorry, the sun's heat always, oh sorry, the sun's heat allows water to change forms from liquid to gas to ice and back again, right? So remember the sun is a source of energy, a source of heat. And if you expose the sun to liquid water, then the particles are going to start moving, 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 and they will move into the next phase and they will become gases. Similarly, if you expose solid ice to sun, the radiation or the heat from the sun will cause those particles to start separating or moving faster, and you will have your solid turn into liquid. Condensation, the colder temperatures high in the atmosphere cause the water vapor to turn back into tiny liquid water droplets, the clouds. This is condensation, the opposite of evaporation, winds in the atmosphere below the clouds all around the globe. Evaporation, the sun causes liquid water to evaporate or turn from a liquid to gas, which is water vapor. The invisible water vapor floats high into the atmosphere the air that surrounds the earth. Most, sorry, most evaporation happens from the ocean since oceans cover 70% of the earth's surface. Any water can evaporate, even the snow on the top of the mountains or the water in the leaves of the trees. So you can go through this um, and you can change from beginner to intermediate. Right, so it gets, it adds more information, right? Fog and dew, you'll notice that there's more stuff for you to look at and advanced. A lot more stuff happening there. So take a look at this really great website. So let's just watch this video. Water is the fundamental ingredient for life on Earth. Looking at our Earth from space, with its vast and deep ocean, it appears as though there is an abundance of water for our use. However, only a small portion of Earth's water is accessible for our needs. How much fresh water exists and where it is stored affects us all. Nearly two-thirds of this fresh water is stored in the polar ice caps, snowpacks, and glaciers, making it inaccessible for long periods of time. The water cycle is dynamic. It describes the continuous movement of water on, above, and below the surface of the Earth, and the transitions from one state to another. Sea surface temperature, surface winds, and air temperature influence the rate of evaporation at the ocean surface. In the tropics, warm ocean surface temperatures support high rates of evaporation. Wind also increases evaporation. When the air's temperature is warmer, it can hold more water. While the atmosphere does not store a large quantity of water compared to the ocean rivers and lakes, it can transport water quickly from one place to another. Low-lying regions of the atmosphere with high moisture and strong winds can form atmospheric rivers to transport water horizontally. 
clouds are formed as water vapor cools and condenses into droplets and ice crystals. Clouds and water vapor act as insulators in the atmosphere. Clouds help shield the Earth from the sun and trap heat from below. When cloud particles grow large enough, they may fall out as rain or snow. Under the right conditions, areas of precipitation can grow into large storms. As storms grow, they transfer heat vertically into the upper atmosphere. The migration of storms helps to distribute heat between the equator and poles, shaping wind patterns globally. How storms grow and intensify depends on atmospheric moisture, surface temperatures, and wind patterns. Precipitation is concentrated in some parts of the world and scarce in others. It can vary substantially from season to season and from year to year. Water that falls on the land surface as precipitation is stored within snowpacks, lakes, reservoirs, soils, and in underground uh aquifers. Water availability varies from place to place and over time. The availability of water affects the type and abundance of vegetation, the primary source of food for animals and people. Extreme water cycle variability, unusually dry or wet conditions, impacts humans worldwide. Each year, hazards such as floods exact a costly economic and human toll. Most of the water that falls onto land remains stored there for weeks or more. Snowfall is stored as snowpack or ice. Meltwater and rainfall are stored in lakes and soils. Some of the water is absorbed by plant roots or drains into the water table. Eventually, the water will evaporate to the atmosphere or return to the ocean in streams and rivers, providing a source of nutrient-rich water that supports ocean life. Sensors on a suite of NASA satellites observe and measure water on land, in the ocean, and in the atmosphere. These measurements are important to understanding the availability and distribution of Earth's water, which is both vital to life and vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and a growing world population. So that video also shows you, again, that Earth system science we were talking about, the interaction between the lithosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. <clears throat> Every step of the way, <clears throat> sorry, throughout this whole video, you can see all the spheres working. So you may have heard about the idea of acid rain. Yeah, so acid rain um, is exactly what it sounds like when the, the rain is no longer as fresh as we'd like it to be. It is basically getting dangerous. There is acid in it, as we mentioned before when we were talking about corrosive materials. Acid is not something that you want to have um, in a high concentration because it damages things in high concentrations that is. So we can see that because of what's happening and what we're doing to our environment and the idea that here, yes, this is a gaseous form. Um, we're putting that out into the atmosphere. It's going into the clouds and polluting and then it is coming back down in the form of precipitation uh, and we're, we're damaging our 
our natural life, right? Our plants and our animals are drinking and being exposed to the acid rain and so are we. So it says one acid, once acid rain falls, polluting gases become part of the water cycle. So we've done irreversible damage. It's in there, it's forever cycling through, unfortunately. So most of the water that is evaporated comes from the oceans, which are salty. This is not new to you. However, rainwater is not salty, it is fresh. That's what we would like it to be. The evaporation condensation process therefore separates pure water from the substances dissolved in it. Okay, because when the water evaporates, it's the water that is going from the liquid to gas phase. The water is evaporating, but it's leaving behind the salts and whatnot that were in the liquid form of the water. So it's kind of like a purification process. In its natural state, rainwater is slightly acidic, so not too much, because of the carbon dioxide in the air. However, this acidity has sharply increased over the 20th century. This is due to the countless human activities that have disrupted the natural water cycle. Various pollutants from industry can be introduced into the water cycle at any stage. These pollutants change the pH value of water. So this is the pH scale. If you have anything below seven, that is considered an acid. Anything above seven is considered to be a base or alkaline. Okay, so we are making the water way more acidic than it should be. This would be natural pure water, water a pH of seven. And then as we go to the left, that's increasing in acidity. And so with all the stuff that we've done with the human activities and releasing dangerous chemicals into the atmosphere, we have introduced more pollutants to the water cycle and have increased the acidity of the water that falls in form of precipitation. So pollutants change the pH value of water. We just said that. Acid rain is highly toxic to ecosystems. It also damages construction materials and is often the cause of changes to the exteriors of buildings and monuments. So you guys just looked for pictures that showed mechanical erosion or mechanical weathering, um, biological weathering and chemical weathering. Something like this, what we're talking about here with the acid rain and it's damaging construction materials and exteriors of buildings. This is an example of what chemical weathering is. This is because of acid rain. So as you see here, yes, H2O, when the water evaporates, it's H2O that is turning into the gas form and entering the clouds. However, here from human activities and industrial buildings and from cars and whatnot, we have these dangerous substances or gases being released into the atmosphere and they too are going up in the clouds. They are undergoing a chemical reaction with water. So you see H2O here interacting or um, reacting with NO2 to make HNO3 which is an acid. And again, we have the water interacting with this to make H2SO4, sulfuric acid. So there is a reaction happening with these substances that create acids, right? These are both acids and they're coming out in the form of precipitation. So the rain is becoming very acidic and you can see here, it says trees killed by acid rain. So it's not a good thing. And the more we leave these industrial buildings to release these dangerous chemicals, uh, the more factories we put up, the more cars we drive, the more acidic the rain will be, the more highly concentrated 
the acid levels will be in the rain. So we'll just watch this quick video about what acid rain is. What is acid rain? Acid rain is any form of precipitation with high levels of nitric and sulfuric acids. It can occur in the form of snow, fog, and even dry materials that settle to earth. Most acid rain is caused by human activities. When people burn fossil fuels, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are released into the atmosphere. These gases react with water, oxygen, and other substances to form sulfuric and nitric acid. Winds may spread these acidic solutions over hundreds of miles. After it falls to earth, acid rain enters water systems as runoff and sinks into the ground. This can make water toxic to crayfish, clams, fish, and other aquatic animals. The rest of the food chain, including non-aquatic species such as birds, is often affected as well. Acid rain also harms forests by damaging trees' leaves, robbing the soil of essential nutrients, and making it hard for trees to take up water. By designing cleaner power plants and using fewer fossil fuels, we can reduce the number of pollutants that create acid rain. What is acid? Alrighty, so that concludes this presentation on the hydrosphere. So we basically looked at how water cycles through the earth and just the different forms of water that we have here on earth. We talked about how there is fresh water and salty water. And unfortunately, 97.5% of the water is salty water, not fresh water. And 2.5% is fresh water. But unfortunately, around 75% or 79% of that fresh water is occupied in frozen forms of water such as polar ice caps, glaciers, and that stuff. So that's why we have to be very careful and do not waste water because yes, there's a lot of water on the earth, but the water that we need to survive needs to be fresh and we don't have a lot of access to that. So again, read the pages before that we're discussing the hydrosphere. And now I'm asking you, you to read these pages that discuss the water cycle and acid rain. Um, I never want you to forget this whole idea that all these spheres are interacting. We've gone through the lithosphere, right? We've been talking about the hydrosphere. <clears throat> The next thing that we will talk about is the atmosphere because we've been referring to it right all this time. So now we're going to take a quicker, a deeper look at the atmosphere and that will be your next class lecture. Um, if you have any questions, remember you never ever ever should hesitate to email me at hinksons at loyola.ca Again, that's Hinkson's at Loyola.ca. Have a good day.